and get started. Welcome everyone to today's conversation with Rob Chestnut, author of Intentional Integrity. My name is Ann Skeet, and I'm the Senior Director of Leadership Ethics at the Markle Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. Before I share a little bit about Rob's uh, very rich background, I want to thank all of you for joining us, uh, including Rob. I'd also like to thank Marissa Palmer, who works with Rob, the event staff here at the Markle Center, Joel Dibble, uh, Debbie Dembecki, Megan Chauvin, Monica DeLong, and our Marcom student interns. I want to let you know that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the center's YouTube channel afterwards. And that if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A and my colleague Joel Dibble is going to be kind of sifting through them for me and helping to group them up so that we can turn towards some of the questions that are on your mind in the second half of the session. So last year in 2020, we were all pretty focused on COVID. Um, and this year in 2021, we've tried to sort of pivot a bit and get uh, back to some of the intangibles that make society work and, and businesses in society function well. In February, in a session that we co-hosted with SVDX, we talked about the importance of trust. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, integrity and being intentional about it. And next month on uh, April 28th, also over at the noon time, we'll be with our former executive director, Kirk Hansen, who will be interviewed um, by two of our students talking about why corporate misconduct persists in spite of the attention being paid to things like trust and integrity. So as I said, today, we're fortunate to have Rob with us. Rob was most recently the chief ethics officer at Airbnb, a role he took on in 2019 after serving as the company's general counsel for four years. He grew the legal staff uh, at Airbnb from 30 people to about 150 legal professionals in 20 offices around the world. And he developed a popular interactive employee program, Integrity Belongs Here, to drive ethics through the company's culture. My colleague, Debbie Dembecki and I were fortunate uh, to sit in on a piece of it, the talk that Rob gives to uh, new employees at an orientation. Rob is a graduate of Harvard Law School and also the University of Virginia. So I guess um, COVID allowed you, Rob, to enjoy being uh, the NCAA champion for two years as a unique perch, as a, as a cavalier. Um, he worked for 14 years with the U.S. Justice Department, where his cases ran the gamut from prosecuting bank robbers to espionage, including the prosecution of CIA employee Aldrich Ames. He joined eBay in 1999, where he later founded the Internet's first person-to-person -person trust and safety operation, and was the general counsel at digital education leader Chegg for six years. So thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Great, great. We really appreciate your being here. And, you know, Rob, you've just sort of um, tipped into a version of retirement, I guess I would call it. Uh, I, something tells me there's a, a second and third act to come. Um, but people take a, a lot of different approaches to retirement. Some folks, you know, they ride off into the sunset and that's it. The last we see of them in professional life. A lot of people cite, oh, I'm going to take six months to a year to do nothing to figure out what to do next. But you, you sort of jumped right in to segue to retirement. You chose to write this book. So why? Uh, ironically, it was not intentional. Uh, you know, my, my, <laughs> my wife, great. you know, when, while I was the general counsel at Airbnb, you know, we had a, a really interesting program about integrity at the company. And my wife, you know, who used to be in the publishing industry a long time ago, you know, to, to my wife, you know, everything looks like a book. You know, because that's the world that she she came from. So she said, you've got to write a book about this. And I'm like, I don't have time to write a book. I'm a general counsel. And she said, no, you've got to do it. It's really important that people hear this. Uh, she said, I'll get you a pub, a major publisher and I'll get you a writer to help you if you do this. I'm like, yeah, honey, right. You get me a major publisher and a writer and I'll do the book. And uh, That was my mistake because my wife, of course, within a, a month had secured both. Uh, but, you know, the... Uh, I actually, uh, the, the more I started working on the book, the more I loved it. Uh, I, I think the world's changing. And in that, I think companies are being uh, pushed to step up and focus on things beyond just profit. They're actually supposed to be focusing on things that are good for the world. And, 
you know, the more I thought about it and the more I started working with the writer, the more I you know, came to sort of agree with my wife, you know, she was right again, uh, that this is a great message and something that needs to get out. And I, uh, uh, by the time I finished writing the book, uh, like I, I'm always a big fan of doing things differently. I, I love spending five, six years in a job and then moving on and trying something completely new in life. And it really struck me that, you know, working on the, the book and talking about the book would, would be a great next step. I, I don't know if I'll call it retirement. I, I like, you know, maybe it's just another phase, another, uh, another something uh, to, to add to, to what you're trying to contribute in life. Well, you've confirmed two things. Uh, one, as I suspected that there is a second and maybe third act for you. And two, what every wife on this uh, webinar already knows, which is the wives are always right. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So tell us what is intentional integrity and how does it differ from just, you know, good old fashioned regular integrity? Well, you know, let's start with integrity is often, you know, phrase, the phrase that you hear the most is, you know, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's watching. The, the, the challenge in today's world, Dan, is that everybody's always watching. You know, in the old days, uh, you know, when I was growing up, there were only three news stations. You know, today we are all our own news station and we all carry with us a camera crew 24-7 uh, in the form of our phone. Uh, and, and, you know, so in today's world, uh, integrity can't be something you just put on a poster, you know, with the word integrity underneath and the lake and the tree. Integrity is something that you need to be intentional about. And that is, you've got to define it. And as part of, I, I think, running any business, you've got to define your purpose, your North Star, and you know, profit is not purpose. So you've got to actually define why you're good for the world. And then you've got to make it part of your strategy to talk about it and implement programs to, to make it part of your company's culture. It can't be the unspoken poster on the wall sort of thing anymore. It has to be a, a part of what you do as a business. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned this, this bit about, um, you know, um, talking about how you're contributing to making things better. Because I could see uh, that some organizations, people leading them would feel kind of, you know, nervous about that. One mm -hmm. of the challenges I find of talking about ethics is that none of us are perfect. So um, I actually come to believe that talking about ethics is either an act of courage or stupidity, <laughs> you know, because you're sort of, you know, putting yourself out there and saying, hey, we're here to try and do good. And in some ways, it, it could make the organization more of a target. So where do you come down on that? Well, you've got to be careful because, well, first of all, integrity is not perfection. And, you know, because if integrity were perfection, then no one would have integrity. I think integrity more is about recognizing that uh, that doing the right thing matters and charting a course to do your best to navigate what can often be, you know, very gray waters uh, to, to get there. And it's also, I think, about having the self-awareness to realize when you've gotten off track because you get off track. And, you know, uh, and when you do get off track, having that self-awareness to say, you know what, you know, maybe we didn't make the right decision here and we're now going to, to shift and get back on course again. I, I think that's just part of it. Uh, integrity is an uncomfortable subject, and I, you nailed it. You know, the reason is that uh, we are not perfect. And look, when I, when I first started working on integrity at Airbnb, my, my fear was, how are people going to receive this? Is this going to be, oh, you got this old lawyer who's talking about morality. Uh, leave me alone, Rob. That's none of your business. Uh, but I, I think in the business world, at least in, in the context of the workplace, uh, it has to be the business of the workplace, at least to the extent that it touches uh, it, it touches the workplace. And again, that gets to your next challenge, right? Because it's not so clear what the workplace is anymore. When I was growing up, my dad used to put on a suit. He'd get in the car, go to work every day. And when he came home, off would come the suit. Uh, and, and so the, the suit almost became a symbol of uh, when you're at work, right? You're, you're wearing a suit, you're in an office, you're at work, you leave the office, you take off the suit, you're no longer at work. Well, that's blown up today. Uh, you know, it, today's, particularly with COVID, right? And, and <laughs> perhaps the new world of remote work, uh, it, it's not so easy to define. You know, we pretty much look the same when we're, uh, the way we dress at work now. Um, the, the workplace and home are often one and the same. So drawing the line between workplace misconduct 
And personal misconduct is a lot harder than it ever used to be because there's not that clear line. Now, you know, workplace misconduct is, you know, any, anything that you do uh, that, that impacts work, uh, anything that any misconduct as it relates to someone else uh, that you work with, no matter where it occurs, that makes it challenging as well. Uh, and so I was nervous, to be honest with you. But, uh, and what, what probably my biggest surprise was the reaction of employees at Airbnb to what we were doing. Uh, it was emotional and it was strong. Uh, people, you know, we, we started doing these uh, uh, interactive orientation classes where we would, we had one hour on integrity when you started at the company. And people would come up to me after these talks. I, I had some folks come up literally in tears. Uh, people saying things like, you know, Rob, I've worked at a number of different places. I've never been at a company that actually talks about this stuff, that actually, you know, sets themselves out to be, this is the kind of company we want to be. We want to operate with integrity. And here's what integrity means in the workplace. And I, I remember one woman looked at me and said, Rob, you have no idea what it means to have a leader in the company come in and talk about this sort of thing right up front. Uh, I, what I've learned is that employees want more than just a paycheck. Uh, look, making money is important, but we all want to feel like we're, we're contributing and doing something good. We're having a positive impact in the world. We want to be part of something that has values that are consistent with our own. And when you, when you set that out as a goal, Again, you don't have to be perfect, but you sincerely set it out as a goal in your words and in your actions and you try to live up to it. Uh, what you find is you start to reach people in their heart. And when you, when you touch people in the heart like that, uh, you, I think you get a much more engaged workforce. You get one that uh, will stay longer, will want to work harder and give everything they've got. Uh, and they'll recruit for you. And this isn't true just for employees. You know, we live in an age of conscious consumerism. You know, and what I mean by that is that people now don't care just about the product or service. They care about what the company's values are. People yeah, want to do yeah. business, right? With companies that have values aligned with their own. And if they believe that the company's values are similar to their own values, they will buy from that company they will be loyal spokespeople for that company. They will be your ambassadors. So if a company isn't really talking about these sorts of things and they aren't reaching people in the heart, they're really missing a huge opportunity, I think, to grow their business and actually make it stronger. Yeah, you're touching on what uh, Dove Seidman wrote about in his book. You know, it's, it's how you do business it's, and, and it's sort of how you conduct it. And I hear in your, in your story, um, the appreciation that employees had for the for engaging in the topic. How about the executives? Were they harder to get talking about ethics? I mean, you did this at a couple different companies. So how did that go? Well, I'm lucky. <laughs> you know, I, uh, wherever I've gone, and some of it may be luck and some of it may be when I look at a company, what I look for is an engaged leadership team that, again, sincerely wants to do the right thing. Like, so at eBay, for example, Meg Whitman, when I was talking to Meg Whitman, uh, you know, Meg Whitman actually showed up at every new employee orientation and spoke to employees herself about the kind of company that she wanted. I remember my first week, she told me, you know, we were a small company when I joined eBay. It was 170 people. And she said, all right, Rob, you're in charge of figuring out what we can buy and sell on eBay. Literally, you know, we were a global company. There were no rules at that point at all. Can you buy and sell guns? What about alcohol, tobacco, uh, you know, ticket scalping, uh, you know, artifacts? And she said, you're in charge. And she said, what I want you to do, Rob, as best you can is figure out where the line is. And then we want to stay one good, clear step back from that line because, you know, we want to do business the right way. We want to be a clean, well-lit marketplace. Uh, you know, similarly, you know, Dan Rosenzweig at Chegg and, and then Brian, you know, Brian and Joe and Nate at Airbnb. Um, these are folks for whom you know, uh, the stock price isn't the only thing or even the most important thing, at least in the short run. And when, you're, when you've got other leaders like that buying in, uh, you know, all things are possible. You know, the, you know, the, the CEO, I like to say, is the thermostat for a company. 
Not, and so what does that mean? You know, a, a thermometer takes the temperature of our A thermostat sets the temperature. And by their words and their actions, leaders at a company are literally creating the temperature or the environment where everyone in the company has to live. So if you've got a leader stomping around saying things like, we have to hit this number no matter what, uh, hit this deadline and I don't care how you do it, just get it done. Well, you're taking that, that thermostat dial, right? And you're turning it to a place where people um, may feel compelled to cut ethical corners. You saw that at Boeing with the deadline to, to release the plane, or you saw it at Volkswagen where there was a, a, a pressure to come up with a zero emissions uh, in a diesel vehicle. Uh, you see it over and over again. You know, on the other hand, you know, I talked to, to some other leaders. Uh, you know, I, I tell the story about uh, you know, Ben Horowitz, who when he was a CEO, he used to sit down with his CFO every quarter with the numbers. And Ben would always look at the CFO in the eye and the rest of the finance leadership team and say, is there anything in these numbers that makes anybody here uncomfortable? Is there anything in here that, that might you believe might be construed as misleading? Anything that you felt pressured to agree to or put in here? Because if so, we're going to change it. We're going to make it right. We might miss a number. Our stock price might go down, uh, but we're not going to go to jail. And when you talk like that, now the dials get set in a different place. And that environment really spreads throughout the entire company. Yeah, you're touching on something when we work with companies. Um, you know, one of the things I look for that's a little bit of a flag for me is kind of that zero sum language, anything that's sort of about winning or being the best or, you know, and it sounds so good when you say it fast. And it's been such a part of business language for so long, but it, it does need to shift and it is shifting. And, and it's important, I think, for all the reasons that you're touching on. You got to be careful about what I call the number on the wall. Um, because, you know, I, when I first got into the business world, I was told that, well, we, we always measure what we do. And what I actually learned, and is that no, actually what happens is you do what is measured. So whatever a company measures, everyone in the company runs toward that number and tries to hit that number, right? Because that's what's measured. That's what everyone's going to be evaluated on. That's what compensation is based on. And I'll give you an example. You know, at Airbnb, early when I first got there, we had a number on the wall and it was 200 million nights. We were going to get 200 million nights this particular year. And everybody was, you know, saw it at the company meetings. We talked about it. And it seems like a law, to, you know, a, a goal that we should all laud. It was a good financial number. And then one day I was looking at some of our hosts, and there were some hosts on the site that, that surprised me. They they got very poor ratings. Uh, guests were unhappy with the experience. And I went and asked the question: Well, why are these hosts still on our website? They're providing a bad experience for our guests. Um, we ought to get them off the site. And I'll never forget the the team looked at me and said. Well, Rob, yeah, we, we know you're right, but we've got to hit 200 million nights. And every night is, every night counts. So we can't get rid of hosts that are providing nights. We need those nights. And that, was, that, that sent warning bells off. And we went off and we fixed that problem because we recognized that putting a number up like that uh, and, and so focusing just on that number to the exclusion of everything else can create bad behaviors that lead to ethical problems. So, for, and it can be so easily changed by coming up with a, a more nuanced, complex metric, such as let's hit a certain number of good nights. Good nights can be described, for example, as nights that uh, a guest has a five-star rating. So now we're in, we've got incentives to do different things that combined will encourage the right behavior. I think you're starting to touch on something that you talk about in the book. Right now, follow the science is uh, a really common uh, comment and encouragement. Um, but how did the science of integrity influence the design of what you did at Airbnb? I, I would love to tell you that I went out and did a lot of careful scientific research before I implemented a single program at Airbnb. Uh, in fact, uh, it wasn't quite that way. Uh, you, you know, you start to write a book, Anne, and when you start to write a book, you think, wow, I really know something. I'm going to share my vast knowledge with the world. And then I thought, then I might talk to my, my writer and say, well, Rob, maybe we should go out and talk to a few other people, get a different perspective. What I learned is that writing a book is a learning journey. 
And I ended up learning a lot more from the journey of writing the book than I had ever learned before I started. One of the things I did was I went, as part of the writing, I went to spend some time with a guy by the name of Dan Ariely. Dan Ariely is a behavioral psychologist at Duke University. Many of you on this uh, uh, broadcast may uh, have seen Dan's podcast or his uh, TED Talks. He's got books. He's got a movie called Dishonesty. He studies dishonesty. And I went and spent a day with him. And you know what Dan taught me was, uh, I used to think, for example, that everybody, uh, that people either had integrity or they didn't. Because right? I was a prosecutor. Right? So I'm out getting, you know, putting people in jail who don't have integrity. Dan explained to me that I had it all wrong. He does a great math experiment where he fills a room up with people, gives them a sheet of math problems, and tells them to do the problems until he says stop. Right. Uh, so people do the problems, he says stop. He then says that you all can come up to the front of the room one by one, take your sheet for the math problems, stick them in the shred. And then as you leave, tell the proctor how many math problems that you did. We're going to give you a dollar for every problem that you tell the proctor you did. So people get up, they put the thing in the shredder, they head out. What Dan doesn't tell them is that he uh, rigged the shredder. The shredder only shreds the outer edge of the piece of paper. So Dan knows exactly how many math problems everybody did. The interesting question is, how many people lie to the proctor for a buck a problem? And the answer surprised me. Uh, you know, everybody have a number in their head right now? What percentage of people, and by the way, Dan does, has done this with tens of thousands of people all around the world, all different nationalities, religions, and the like. Numbers are consistent. 70% of people lie. 70%. Now, most fudge. And what do I mean by fudging? Fudging means that they do it, but not by a blatant amount. They'll fudge by a problem or two problems or three problems. And what Dan taught me is that integrity isn't black and white that all of us every day have issues that confront us where we have to apply some level of integrity. We're all tempted to choose the answer that benefits us personally. That's the temptation as human beings, all of us have that. Now, why don't we all always choose the, the option that benefits us? Because we still have to feel good about ourselves as a human beings, we have to feel like we have integrity. So. What happens is we have to, we will then try to rationalize behavior. So the question really then becomes, how good are you at rationalizing what you're thinking about doing? If you can rationalize the behavior, if you can convince yourself that it's okay, then you're likely to do it. So for example, in the math problems, some people could say, oh yeah, well, my pencil broke. Or I saw other people still doing a problem after he said, put the pencil down. Or they're not paying me enough for this experiment. Things like that cause you to fudge and all people are tempted to do it. So what Dan explained to me is, if you want to create an environment of integrity, um, the way to do it is you've got to reach that human emotion that wants to feel good about yourself, right? Uh, and he explained to me that workplaces where there's a lot of creativity, if they're smart, creative people, they are the ones that are most prone to integrity issues because those folks are great at coming up with rationalizations. Right? Marketing folks, for example, famous for wanting to push the envelope on claims. Why are they so good at it? Because they're really clever at coming up with creative ideas to explain why what they're doing is okay. So Dan modifies the experiment to prove the point. Everything is the same, except this time at the beginning of the math experiment, Dan says to everybody, I want you to write down as many of the 10 commandments as you can remember. And then after everybody's had a chance, then we'll do the same exercise again. So what does Dan learn? Well, Dan learns first that no one can remember all the Ten Commandments. In fact, most people can't even remember half of them, right? But something really interesting happens to his results. When he asks people to write down the Ten Commandments at the beginning, cheating virtually disappears. It goes to under 10%. Why? Because when you remind people of their higher self, when you remind people of the importance of ethics and integrity and a higher order, people will naturally stop budging. So if you want to get people in the workplace, Dan told me, to act with integrity, focus on the little things, the things that discourage people from doing the little fudging. Because what happens with fudging is once you start, the brain gets used to it. It gets better and better at convincing yourself. The little fudging, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and pretty soon you're way out of the frame with bad behavior. Focus on little things and create that environment. So in that way, Ann, it's interesting. Integrity is really contagious. 
So if people around you have integrity, or actually more importantly, if you believe that people around you have integrity, that actually pushes you to have integrity as well because you want to feel like you're as good as they are. And leaders are critical carriers. Leaders have the most impact. So if you see a leader acting with integrity in their words and in their actions, that pushes you to be the same way. On the other hand, if you see leaders who are doing things that are unethical, that creates that different temperature. That in turn becomes contagious and integrity goes downhill. Yeah, this sort of idea of ethical contagion, I think is really powerful. And Dan's work is pretty compelling. He's a great storyteller. We use one of his videos with students and they really, it, it really resonates with them. There's another book called Blind Spots by Anne Ten Brunzel and Max Bazerman out of Harvard that also kind of helps people to start thinking a little bit about, you know, how it is that even those of us that want to think of ourselves as always doing the good and right thing, we're still going to make mistakes and still going to fudge, as you say. Sure, so we all have integrity. All of yeah. us. I've never yeah. been in an audience. Whenever I ask people to raise your hand, how many people here have integrity? Everybody raises their hand, right? Yeah. Yet, yeah. Problems continue to occur. And I think part of the challenge is we all think we have integrity so we don't have to worry about, it. oh, I don't have to worry about that code of conduct stuff or that, or that ethics stuff because I'm a good person. The truth is we do need to all think about it because we're all constantly tempted to fudge. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, what we call nudges, sort of as we talk, and when we think about um, the way that we can set people up for success, those reminders around the small things, as you point out, are often really helpful. You have some rules that you share uh, in the book, uh, and they're pretty engaging. Um, you do it through code moments, sort of little case studies where you help people to see what the issues really are. But share with us, what are some of your favorite rules? Well, I think you've got to be specific about integrity, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one, one rule that you often see at companies is, you know, don't, don't engage in inappropriate romantic relationships. Well, that's great. What's an inappropriate romantic relationship? That, that's left up to everyone to, uh, to interpret for themselves. And that's how we end up with problems where CEOs are engaging in romantic relationships with more junior employees that in turn explode, the careers get ruined, the brand gets tarnished. So I went into an executive meeting at Airbnb one day there are a dozen of us on the executive team. And we talked about sexual harassment and we talked about these sorts of issues. And I proposed to everybody in the room, if we're on the executive team at the company, why don't we all agree that none of us will have any romantic relationship of any kind with any employee or any supplier, period. We just won't do it. And there was silence in the room for a minute. One of the folks looked at me and said, well, Rob, we're already all married or in relationships anyway, so that really shouldn't even be a problem. And I said, well, judging from what I'm reading online, being married or in a relationship doesn't stop people from behaving this way. So let's talk, let's say it again. What do you want to do? And we actually went around the room. Each person said, I'm in. And then we put it in the code of conduct that if you're on the executive team, you will not, even a consensual relationship, you won't engage in any romantic encounter with any employee in the company. And then I don't think we broke too many hearts in the company when we announced this. But what I think we did do was we set out with intentionality to explain that our position as leaders, um, we were taking that more importantly than any you know, uh, sexual desires that we were gonna have. And we were committing it to each other, which meant that if any of us did stray, um, it was breaking a commitment to the other members of the executive team. And we as leaders would be the ones that would be punished for that. Uh, not the, you know, the, a junior person wouldn't simply be transferred away. Um, another uh, rule that we talked about is alcohol. Alcohol in the workplace. Now, I kept noticing that so many times when I was doing investigations and seeing bad behavior at a company, the bad behavior was often preceded by drinking too much alcohol in a work set. And that in turn led to doing something you know, really dumb. So we started talking about alcohol intentionally at work. And we created uh, guidelines uh, for what was expected. So uh, we, didn't, we really did not want people serving hard liquor at work-related functions. Um, we did not want work-related functions to, uh, where alcohol was served to last longer than two or three hours. Uh, and I started talking to people about being intentional uh, in how much you drink. 
And I explained you know, what, I, what I called Rob's rule that everybody at Airbnb now knows. Uh, so my rule is this. Uh, I like when I go out and travel and, and work, I don't mind having a drink with folks on the team at, at dinner, uh, enjoy a local wine or a local beer. Uh, I know that I can have two drinks in a work setting and I'm not going to do anything stupid. However, you get more than two drinks, I really am not sure depending on how much food I've had, how many hours I've traveled, how strong the drink is. So my personal rule is I will never, ever, ever, under any circumstances whatsoever, have more than two drinks in any work setting. And a work setting for me, by the way, is if I'm with somebody from work, it's a work setting. And that's my personal rule. And I told everybody at the company, you don't need to adopt Rob's rule. That's my personal rule. Uh, but you need a rule. Your rule might be you don't drink alcohol at all, great. Or you don't drink in a work setting, super. Maybe you'll have a one drink rule or a two drink rule. I know somebody that has a rule that they only drink with strangers, which of course is interesting. It may lead to its own problems. But the, the point is that too often people don't think about this stuff. The worst time to think about how much alcohol you should be drinking in a work setting is while you're drinking alcohol in a work setting. So I urged everybody in the company, their first week at the company, think about it, know yourself, make your own rule, and then stick with it at the company. And setting a tone like that, requiring that all any, any uh, work-related function always serve non-alcoholic beverages if you serve alcoholic beverages. Always serve food if you're serving alcoholic beverages. And have the events end after three hours maximum. Those things create that setting, that environment, where you're far less likely to have a problem. Thanks. You also talk about some really practical aspects of getting people to feel comfortable to come forward, like the use of hotlines. So I want you to share some of what you've learned about those useful practices. And while you're doing that, I want to remind the people that are um, with us that they can put questions that they'd like to have Rob address into the q and I talk to people at companies who say, well, Rob, I don't think we've got any ethics problems. We've got this hotline. And we hardly ever get any complaints. And my response to that is, actually, that's the first sign that you've got a problem. Because there are ethical choices that employees have to make every day at your company. The question isn't whether you've got those ethical challenges. The question is, do you have an environment where people are comfortable talking about them and coming to a good decision about the right path? Uh, people don't want to go to legal. Uh, and I guess a lawyer, that, that deeply hurts me <laughs> to realize that, that folks aren't excited about running to see the legal department. People don't want to go to HR. People don't want to be a whistleblower. So if you want to find out what's going on, and if you want people to feel comfortable talking about ethical challenges that they see, you've got to put out the welcome mat. You can't just have a, a hotline link buried three uh, pages deep into your corporate internet and expect people to overcome a natural fear of lawyers and HR folks. Uh, you've got to go out really and make that effort to make people co feel comfortable. So one way that we did this was with a program called Ethics Advisors. It struck me the irony that ethics and integrity had to be owned by legal. I think it's rich, right? There are so many bad lawyer jokes out there about, about lawyers. Why does the legal department have to own integrity? Why shouldn't integrity be owned by everybody? So what we did is we went out to all the different groups in the company and we found one or two people on a team, uh, senior enough to have good judgment, but not so seniors to be scary. And we asked them to be ethics advisors. We gave them two or three days of training at headquarters on the code of ethics. We taught them the 10 most common ethical questions that would likely come up within the company. And then we sent them back to their day job. And so we had people in engineering, marketing, customer support, sales, finance, people in the Paris office, people in the Korea office. And these folks then became an ambassador really for the code of ethics and for integrity. And we told everybody on the team, if you've got an ethical question or you've got a problem, you can go to the hotline, you can go to legal, you can go to HR, uh, or you can go talk to your ethics advisor, somebody on your team that you probably know. You might work side by side with. What did we learn? Well, guess what the number one most used avenue was for raising ethical questions? It was the ethics advisors. In fact, we would, we would actually uh, track 
inquiries to ethics advisors. And we would track the types of questions they got. We got more issues raised through ethics advisors than all the other avenues combined. You're over a hundred a quarter. And that's a real message to all of us that if you want to have a place that has integrity, you have to create a team, a, a company where there's not one chief ethics officer, but there are 5,000 of them, where it is broadly owned, where people are comfortable raising a question to someone that they know and are comfortable talking to. Uh, because once these things come to light, you know, there's no such thing as a problem uh, if you know about it and can address it. The real big issues are the ones that people are afraid to talk about that are kept secret until one day they blow up. So one of the expressions that caught my eye was a shared practice that you and uh, your wife, Jillian, talk about of nurturing empathetics. And in a model we work with at the Markle Center around encouraging healthy uh, cultures in organizations, the first set of practices we recommend is actually around nurturing empathetic relationships. So why do you think that's so important? Well, I think there's a natural assumption that everybody's going to uh, speak up for their own, speak up for their own type, that, that women are going to speak out about women's rights, that individuals who are, uh, who are gay are going to speak out for gay rights, that you know, employees of color are going to speak out for uh, the rights of those groups. What is so powerful is when someone who is outside of a group speaks up for that group, right? If someone thinks and cares about some group that they're not a part of and raises their hand and talks about it, uh, the, the power that projects both to the group and to others, it sends a powerful message that, you know what, one group's problems are really all of our problems and we all need to be thinking about it. And that's what changes cultures. That moves the thermostat. Uh, that creates an environment where people feel like they belong at work every day. And so if you can talk to leaders about that and you can ask them to think outside of their own box and think about how would you feel if you were the only woman in the room? How would you feel if you were the only person of color in the room? That if you walked into a room and you were the individual that, that were different, that looked different somehow, how would you feel? And understanding that can help change your entire perspective on how you should act when you are in those rooms. So that seems really like an important point, given how much attention, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are getting in the workplace. Is there anything else you want to say on that topic before we move to some of the questions? That's actually one of the questions that came in from, um, from the audience. Uh, you know, I, I want, uh, when I was doing the, the Airbnb integrity program, I wanted to get away from this idea that there's one person with all the answers, right? that there's an integrity guru who decides what has integrity. It's like Moses coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and, and dropping them in front of everybody. I, that approach doesn't work in the company. Why? Because integrity can often be gray. Uh, integrity can be uh, informed by our life experiences, by our religion, by our socioeconomic background, which means that different people can, in good faith, look at the same scenario and come up with very different answers. So if you wanna get things right, you need to have diverse perspectives, which is one of the reasons we focus on having a very diverse group of ethics advisors, because ethics advisors would all chime in and contribute when we had ethical issues come up at the company. And I would learn so much, right? I would go into it originally with, oh, I know the right answer here. And then I would start listening to 10 different people who were different than I was. And at the end, I might change my mind and come away, I think, better informed. I would hate walking into a room at Airbnb where everybody looked like me. That's almost a recipe for coming up with the wrong answer. Uh, I remember when Airbnb had challenges with hosts who were accused of discriminating, who were turning away people I, I, based upon the color of their skin. And it was interesting, the reaction inside the company was shock. They couldn't believe that hosts would actually do that. And I remember looking around and saying, why is everybody so surprised about this? We all know that there's racism throughout the world. Why would we think that it would be any different in a large global uh, community like Airbnb? Of course it exists. And then I looked around the room and I realized that, you know what? We're not that diverse. None of us in this room have been discriminated against. And if none of us have been, I haven't been discriminated against in life. 
So of course we're going to be we're going to miss it. Of course we're not going to be as sensitive to the issue as we should be. If we had been more diverse earlier, we probably would have caught the issue a lot earlier. And so it became a priority to fix that issue uh, so that we would become, I think, a lot, a lot better at understanding it and then solving. Yeah, and you know, in addition to that diverse perspectives, there's now um, a number of research studies that really confirm that more diverse groups, they actually reach higher quality decisions. They work harder, they prepare uh, more thoroughly. Um, so all those things really contribute to better business outcomes, I think. They do. I, I read a study recently, a UK study. They compared the performance of companies who had more than one female board member with companies that had zero or one female board member. And there was a clear difference in the financial performance. Companies that had more than one female board member substantially outperformed companies that had zero or one. And it, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. How can you as a company operate at the top if you don't look like your customer base, right? And if you don't have the sort of diverse perspectives, I think that you need to make intelligent decisions. So I see laws now that are attempting to require companies to have a certain number of, uh, of female board members, for example. And th that's fantastic. But the sad thing is that companies, that, that you need a law. Because if, if you're really thinking about trying to get the best business performance, the data is really clear. You ought to be running to do this anyway. You shouldn't be doing it simply as a compliance matter. It's just smart business. Well, since you touched on compliance matters, one of the questions we have is about that, um, about the reality that ethics in the boardroom is kind of devalued in the name of compliance. And so why is it that each of them are not seen as equally important? Well, compliance is important, but integrity is different than compliance. And the problem with compliance, Anne, is that uh, for so many places, it's a check the box exercise. It's a legal matter, right? We've got to do this because the law requires it. So let's, for example, uh, we've got to have a code of ethics. Right. So um, let's get a code of ethics. Well, let's have our law firm send us one to make sure we get one that's legally right. Or we'll copy one from another website. We'll put our company's name at the top. And then we well, we got to email it out to everybody and get a get them to check a box saying they've read it. Well, that's fine from a compliance perspective, but everybody knows that it's just a legal thing. Right. And you're not reaching people in the heart that way. And if you want to have a truly effective compliance organization, what you need to do is layer it with integrity. Because what integrity does is it gives people a sense of mission. It gets them in the heart. And then they're doing it because they believe that it's the right thing to do, not just because a lawyer checks the box. So I think they're both really important, but if you're only focused on compliance, you're missing a huge opportunity. And in fact, I think you run a real danger of, of having a company that gets weary of watching the one hour video that some third party produced and having to check the box because the lawyers say you've got to do it. Here's our annual certification of the code of conduct that's coming in through the email. I better check the box. And that sort of stuff, it, it may look good on a, a report to the board that you're 100% compliant, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't actually do any good or change the way that people think. So someone in the audience would like to know if you have any tips, Rob, on figuring out how ethical a company's environment is before you accept an offer to work there. It's a great question. Uh, I will tell you one thing I, I, I'll do is if the leader of the company has written a book, read the book. Uh, there, there was, for example, when I was a federal prosecutor, I was offered a job by a Silicon Valley company with a rather uh, colorful CEO. Uh, I read the book. And after I read the book, I said, I'm not working for this person. <laughs> really? Um, integrity to me, there's some clues, right? I mean, it's hard to get into someone's mind and in their heart, but there are clues. I look for big egos. If someone's got a big ego, if it's all about them, if they're talking about, they're using the word I a lot when they're talking about the company. Um, if, they're, if the company's annual report has a big picture of them, splashed like a full page picture on there, right? It's, it's a clue that, that you know, things are being done not for the mission or the purpose of the company, but they're doing it to satisfy a particular person's ego. That's a big warning sign for me. Uh, so 
you know, read a book, uh, listen carefully, get, get as much information as you can, go watch videos. There's so much information, Dan. If I wanted to learn about a company when I was growing up, I had to go to Encyclopedia Britannica, which is probably a 10 year old volume and read about it. Today, there's got to be a video of the leader speaking at a conference. Um, there's, they may actually have a book. Uh, also, LinkedIn is terrific because uh, in today's world, you know somebody who works there or you know somebody who knows somebody who works there. And listening to somebody who's actually had the experience uh, can be, can really, you can learn a lot. You can even learn a lot by the company's press releases. Does the company talk only about profit? Do they talk only about revenue? Or are there messages at least layered with a bigger sense of purpose and mission that suggests that the company is really uh, understands that they've got a bigger place in the world. So do the research because the research, the information is out there and available. The clues are there for you if you want to see it. So, you know, we're in Silicon Valley. So obviously the tech industry is, uh, gets a lot of attention and focus uh, here. And uh, one of the questions is from a Markle Center alum who's now working in AI ethics in a Silicon Valley company. And she's working regularly with product teams. And her question is, she's curious to know what strategies you found that are effective in talking to engineers, um, where it's sometimes hard to quantify the importance of ethics the way they would think about it. So any advice? Yeah, we actually had integrity for engineers. We actually had a class that was focused <laughs> on uh, particular ethical issues that engineers face. Uh, and what we had a half a dozen or so scenarios, uh, again, real life stuff that actually comes up. And uh, so I think for, you have to bring it to the level where people understand how it affects them. Uh, so for an example, we, we would, uh, at one of the scenarios, I remember we would say that, um, you know, you're, you're new to the company. Uh, the, there's a member of, uh, you know, your manager says that you're, you're hiring and you're looking for good engineers. If anybody knows any good engineers, um, you know, send them my way. So uh, the question I ask is, you know, this was a new group of engineers just started at the company. Are there any, are there any ethical issues here? And to a person, everyone said there are no ethical issues. And then I said, how many of you have an agreement with your previous company that you will not recruit? Or you will not encourage anyone at your previous company to leave your company? And then there's silence in the room for a minute. I said, so can you actually pick up the phone, send an email to one of your former colleagues and encourage them to leave the company ethically? And they understood the answer is no. But not only do they understand that the answer is no, they get another message from Airbnb. The message is, we may want good engineers. We may really need to hire good engineers, but you know what? We're gonna respect the fact that you've got an agreement not to recruit from your previous employer. We're gonna respect that so much that we're gonna make sure we remind you of that in your first week here at Airbnb. And the hope is of course, that one day when you leave Airbnb, you will be as respectful of our rules that as we are asking you to respect the previous company's rules. And that's just one example, but you have to bring it to the issues that really impact them as engineers. For example, we have a scenario around using code. Suppose you get an assignment to do a project at Airbnb and you realize that it has a lot of similarities to something you did at the last company where you work. And lo and behold, you go into, what is it, GitHub? And uh, your password still works. What can you do? Can you go look at the old code that you wrote? Can you copy and paste it? What do you do in those scenarios? And that gets people thinking in ways that maybe they haven't thought before, but wow, it brings the message home. And it also brings a strong message home about what you stand for as a company. So you're touching on something that's actually getting some attention in Silicon Valley, which are these agreements. And there are a lot of different versions. So the one you're referencing is, is about um, bringing intellectual property from a, a previous employer. There's also um, non-disclosure agreements around settling cases of sexual harassment and other things. And those are starting to lose some favor. Do you have an opinion about those, that sort of practice? 
I think the, the practice of using non-disclosure agreements to settle um, you know, claims of misconduct is in and of itself an egregious uh, integrity violation. You know, we, we thought about it at Airbnb. And you know, I, I remember looking at all the sexual harassment cases. What do they all have in common? Well, I found that they had you know, two things in common. You know, number one, uh, employees were always uh, had given up their right to sue, that they had to go to arbitration, where, of course, things are, you know, uh, confidential, and quiet. Second thing was that the, uh, they seemed to always settle, and the terms of the settlement uh, were always confidential, and individuals were required to sign NDAs as part of the settlement. That, in turn, made it possible for the perpetrator to continue to do the bad acts, right? Um, so I asked the question, well, why do we have to send these cases to arbitration? And the answer was, well, that, that's the way it's always done. And I said, you know what? Employees matter. Uh, what would it be like to work at a company where we tell employees, we'd like to work things out with you. We, we, we believe in you and you're an important partner. So all we ask is that you come to us in good faith and tell us what your problem is. And we, you try to resolve it with us up front. If we can't resolve it to your satisfaction, you choose. You can go to court or you can go to arbitration. Pick the one that works best for you. And then we will make one further promise to you. We will not enter into any NDA that will uh, prevent people from talking about the facts underlying the claim. So all we will ask is that the exact terms of the financial settlement not be disclosed. However, you are always going to be free to talk about the underlying problem. We are never going to be in a position where we're covering up what happened. We think the cover-up actually looks a lot worse than whatever the underlying issue is. So we're going to be open about it. And uh, you, know, you know what? I, I think that employees appreciate the trust. They appreciate the fact that, that you know, we're treating them with respect and that you know, that sort of openness is going to be a part of our culture. And, and I look, I, I think that NDAs, if, if they aren't illegal in your state already, uh, you know, the IRS disfavors them. Some states are starting to do it. Um, why not do the right thing and just voluntarily put out a statement saying we are eliminating arbitration requirements for employees and we are eliminating NDAs for um, the un facts underlying the claim. We're not going to be afraid of whatever comes out. That's the way the world's moving. Yeah, it is the way the world's moving. And you, you, you're you calling out something that's really important. Uh, we ethicists would refer to it as moral autonomy, but sort of that recognition that all of us can and sh uh, should be allowed to sort of reach some decisions on our own about what's right and wrong. And organizations that recognize that and they build systems around that. So your ethics advisors are one example of that. But this story is an, an example too. What you're really doing there, you are creating that climate of trust uh, because you're, you're respecting the individual and the individual's rights and you're balancing that with the organizations. And when people do see that, um, you know, and our, we have some research that supports that, um, it really, it, it allows ethics to be used much more easily in organizations um, because that, that trust has been established. So there's nothing a, quite as powerful. Uh, particularly in an employee-employer relationship, as doing something against yourself, your apparent self-interest, right? So if you're an employer and you stand up, you know what, employees, we're going to do this. We're not asking for anything in return. We're going to give you the right now to file a claim in court or an arbitration. It's your decision. And, you know, there's no, there's no catch. There's no, nothing taken in return. We're just going to do it because we think it's the right thing to do. And we believe that as employees, you deserve that choice. That has power and it sends a message to employees that this is the kind of place that cares about me and really wants to do the right thing, even though, look, that may mean that we've got a lawsuit in court. Something might become public. It might be more expensive. It might be embarrassing in the moment. But again, remember to go, what, to go back to what I said earlier, there are no secrets anymore anyway. Okay. Stuff comes out. It's going to come out anyway. And I, would, I do not want to be in the position where I'm trying to enforce an NDA and try to keep something silent in today's world. It looks horrible and it's a terrible position to be in. I wanna be on the side of transparency and truth. I might not even agree with it, but I'm gonna stand up for someone's right to, to put it out there, they believe it. So back up to the top of our conversation and the question that came from the audience about 
you know, what happens in the boardroom. When you're having these conversations at Airbnb with the other ex- members of the executive team, for example, to take this somewhat um, bold uh, step or nonconformist step around NDAs, for example, what, how's that decision getting made? Is there a, is there a, f- a framework that for consistent decision-making that's being applied? And if there is something like that, what are they using in the organization um, to, to guide them? Well, we talk about it at the executive team. And you know, look at the, the founder, CEO have to be aligned when you're, uh, when you're doing something like this. But again, Brian, uh, the founder of Airbnb didn't go to business school. Uh, he, his parents were both social workers. So he looks at things, the world a little differently. He went to design school, very creative. And he, he likes to think of things uh, about, you know, set out where you want to be first. He always used the phrase, I want to go where, the, I want to skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck is. So when you've got a leader who's willing to do that, when, to ha- take that sort of forward thinking approach, and who isn't sort of confined by this is the way it's always been done. You know, this is Brian's first job, really, is being a CEO founder of a company. So he's a lot more open, I think, to doing something that makes sense as opposed to doing something that's always been done before. Well, the fact that the company was led uh, by someone with a design background um, doesn't surprise me, considering that I know you, you talk a little bit about ethical design in the book. So what does that mean to you? Well, I mean, it's about thinking, really thinking about integrity, uh, not just doing the way you've always done something. So again, you know, get a code of ethics from the law firm, email it out, check. Uh, you know, put up the poster on the wall that has the, the lake and the tree with the word integrity, check. You know, get that compliance poster with the four point font, check. Uh, the one hour sexual harassment video that some third party company produces, make sure everybody watches that, check. That's the way that it's done. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that's the most effective way or the way that it has to be. And in a very, in a world that's changing significantly, uh, you know, for me, Designing something that makes sense for this new world, uh, that's the way that you need to be operating. And, you know, look, if you've got a leader that is open to new thinking, like, you know, I, I was fortunate that I had, uh, you know, you can, you can change a culture. You know, we, we had a, a, a culture at Airbnb around integrity where employees are proud of it. People talk about it. And I, I think that doesn't mean that Airbnb is not going to ever have problems. Everybody's got problems, particularly if you're a large company. The spotlight's on you constantly. Uh, but I, I think you're less likely to have significant problems. And I think you've also developed a framework where if you make a mistake, you can, like we, where, where we were talking about discrimination on Airbnb. You know, Brian said, you know what? I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed that this sort of thing has happened on our platform and uh, we're going to fix it. And I think that, that I think sets you up for long-term success. Yeah, so what you're really talking about is taking responsibility for what you make or create. And um, I think that's a, a great place for us to leave our conversation um, with that um, sort of guidance for people to be thinking about that with intentionality. So Rob, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your willingness um, to be with us today, but also the very good work you've done in the book. The book is one of the most readable um, books. I showed it to one of my colleagues and I'm like, that's a big book. I'm like, no, it goes really fast. <laughs> and I do think the code moments are part of that because they, it sort of brings to light the issues. So, um, so I highly recommend it. And, uh, if today's topic has been interesting, again, I'll just invite those of you that are with us to tune in next month on April 28th, when we're going to be visiting with, uh, the former executive director of the Markless Center, Kirk Hansen and um, talking to him about corporate misconduct and why even with all this, uh, these great new approaches, it still persists. Thank you again, Rob, for being here. Thanks everybody.